Carl here from Metal Wanny, and this evening I have the great pleasure of hanging out with one of my favourite artists and personalities in music. A multi-instrumentalist best known for his work as part of the internationally acclaimed God is an Astronaut, and now venturing into more solo pastures. It is, of course, none other than Jamie Dean. And Jamie, once again, it is always a pleasure to see you, my friend. It's a pleasure to see you as well, Carl. Thanks so much for talking to me today. My pleasure, my friend. Um, so before we kick off, I know you know this, but I want it on record that I've been living with Alaska for a couple of weeks now and don't feel I can go any further with you here this evening before first congratulating you on a truly stunning piece of music, my friend. Seriously, congratulations once again. Well, thanks a million, Carl. I, I appreciate it a lot. You know, a good bit of work has gone into it over the last number of months and trying to pick the lead single off uh, the next sort of series of, of tracks that I've done uh, was a tough one. But I, you know, I settled on Alaska. So I'm very glad that you uh, that you respond well to it. Fantastic. Yeah, no, seriously, fell in love with it immediately. It's been on repeat in, ever since. But I wanted to start this off by mentioning one of the observations I've had while speaking to artists over the last two years, because... What's becoming more and more apparent to me is that there is now a great deal of material or side projects or solo ventures that wouldn't have necessarily ever come to fruition or at least seen the light of day were it not for the pandemic taking these artists off the road. And I know you've yeah. kind of come out and said that this material you wrote at a time you weren't able to tour, but is this something that would have happened eventually regardless or is it a direct result of the circumstances you found yourself in the last two years? Yeah, it's probably a bit of both. Um, I have wanted to put out so much material for a few years now, um, but I suppose we were always very busy preparing for tours, obviously with the band. Um, the pandemic obviously shut all of that down temporarily for, for every touring musician. Um, so while it, it had its challenges and obviously the, the, the lockdown was difficult for for everyone really, but uh, what it afforded me was a bit of extra time to focus on um completing the solo work because it's one thing having the idea and the intention of doing something but actually following through practically putting in the time to bring it to fruition is a, is a whole other ball game so i was grateful in, in that re retrospectively when you know when i look back on those two years i'm actually really grateful for the time the extra time that i had because as i said it allowed me to um to really kind of hammer down and to just put the time in to uh to bring it all together so um yeah i mean it, it, it's 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 one of those things where it probably would have happened uh, either way but i just i think it was accelerated by the lockdown love it thank you so much because when i listen to alaska it doesn't feel like a haphazard encounter or, or like a half thought out composition born out of some sort of lockdown cabin fever it feels very assured and very grounded in whatever it is it's trying to communicate and I love that it ushers you in with this sense of space and room to breathe. And it kind of takes your hand through this journey. So even as that intensity begins to seep in later on, you never feel too overwhelmed by what's happening. And at the end, it just kind of gently releases you into what I assume will come next. But to your mind, is this a fair assessment of Alaska? And what is it about this track that spoke to you as far as choosing as your leading single was concerned? Yeah, it's a pretty spot on assessment, Carl. Um, one of the great things about instrumental music um, is that people can kind of assign their own meaning to it. Uh, with Alaska, simply the imagery was, you know, imagine yourself uh, lost in Alaska uh, at nighttime and you're a bit afraid, the things are a little bit uncertain, but then all of a sudden uh, you experience this beautiful sunrise and uh, it's, it, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's, overwhelming hmm. that was just the imagery there was something really profoundly deep behind it um that was kind of the the imagery that i was writing to um but yeah it it, it um parts of it obviously you know the melancholic piano was something that we traditionally do with the band and then i kind of wanted to open it up into something new and as you accurately said it the, the kind of second half if you will of the track where it becomes a little bit more if you say let's call it sort of predominantly electronic and or you know the arpeggiated synth bass and stuff um that would be the direction the next track is kind of is, is, is going in so it's kind of all it's setting up the tone a little bit um i'll obviously i'm first and foremost a a piano player really i mean that was my first instrument so i'll always include the piano in in my compositions 
uh, as often as possible without it becoming derivative, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I, I think with, with instrumental music as well, you, you know, you can, people say sometimes, would you not put in vocals in, in your music? But <laughs> for me, it's, not, <laughs> it's not really what I'm, a, what I'm interested in doing. For me, it's, it's, it's almost a form of escapism. You know, there are many unhealthy forms of, of escapism. Um, and, you know, we could talk about those for days. But, but music for me is one of the few healthy modes of escapism that you can kind of immerse yourself in. And um, I think it's just a good way of, you know, as, I, as you know, talking about the lockdown, even that was, that was a challenging time. And, and, and for me, it was a really healthy, productive way to manage the stressors mm-hmm. and stuff like that, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, uh, it's exciting. I'm really excited about, about the project. As I said, it's something I've been wanting to do for a very long time. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited now going forward for the, uh, the follow-up releases. I love that. And that, that imagery you describe, you know, that you, that you wrote Alaska to, I know that in the past with your music, whether it's a song or an entire record, some of it has been inspired by an objective point of view while others have been inspired by a purely emotional and even spiritual point of view. And Alaska mm. is an interesting title within itself. It's a place with cold but humbling connotations attached to it, right? So when you think of the song just in its entirety, thinking back to writing it, you know, do you get a sense that it came from a detached objective place or an emotional one with that imagery? Oh, it's probably a bit of both. Again, um, mm-hmm. again, it comes back to the subjectivity of music. You know, For when I when I wrote that composition, it was okay. So it was two things. It's, it was definitely a reflection of how I was feeling in the moment, um, but it was also a way of managing the uncertainty of the lockdown. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and it kind of this project is like it's 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 funny because I don't know what it is yet. You know. I know roughly what I want to say creatively and musically, but I, I, the, 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 the path hasn't been carved yet. Mm-hmm. So as we have this conversation now, it's really just me writing the best music that I can write. That's the most accurate reflection of who I am as a person, mm-hmm. uh, different things that, that I've sort of gone through in the past, the, 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 good, the, the ups and the downs, you know, mm-hmm. and just trying to put it, package it all together in such a way that's, potentially presentable further down the road um but again just not to repeat myself but you know it does come de- come back to the subjectivity of music people can listen to it and that is the beauty of instrumental it's like you can one piece of music can mean something so um definitive to to to, to one person but then the exact same composition can mean something entirely different to somebody else you know mm-hmm. so i suppose it's about the meaning you assign to it um and and uh you know how you uh, how you can relate to it you know regularly i love that answer man and you know speaking of visuals i was i, I kind of i was quite taken aback by the the visual of the artwork for alaska because one of the mm. ongoing or consistent elements i've seen throughout your career is a great deal of care given to your visuals and I know once upon a time, God as an astronaut relied fairly heavily on that audio visual experience. And in the earlier days, especially, it could be quite confronting or controversial and political even. But I guess I'm speaking more to things like album covers and again, more specifically, the recent artwork for Alaska. Um, yeah. That level of care and attention you give to the imagery in God as an astronaut, and now that you continue to give to your solo work, I mean, it would be so much easier for you to just slap a generically pretty picture up there and call it a day, right? Um, so I'm curious as to why it is that the visual representation of your music has remained so important to you that you carry it over and apply it within the context of your solo work. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because <laughs> I can't take the credit for that because I, I actually initially was looking at sort of stock images of Alaska. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but Torsten sat me down and said, Jamie, look, if you're going to lead with this as your lead single, you're going to need to come up with something a little bit more abstract here, you know. Mm. Um, so we, we, he's been a tremendous help, you know, both in the studio and, and outside the studio. Torsten, obviously, I've got, I've got as an astronaut. Mm-hmm. Um, he's helped me along the way and encourage me. He is just a wealth of experience. Mm-hmm. Um, again, both inside the studio and outside, he, he's, he's a very, very close friend and, uh, and probably my biggest musical influence to be perfectly honest, but he, he is, uh, he is responsible 
wholeheartedly responsible for the, uh, the interesting artwork. Um, we kind of sat down, we talked about it back and forth. And, you know, the, the artwork, it kind of captures the idea of the, the inner workings of the, of the, of the, of the human mind, um, the complexities involved in the brain. Um, and it's probably a little bit of a, of a nod to people struggling with mental health issues and stuff like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, and I also just felt it was really fitting. Visually, it, 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 it pairs well with uh, what the music is saying sonically, you know? I thought it was a good fit. So after, after a, you know, a, a, bit, a bit of back and forth, uh, we, we, we landed on, on, on that. And uh, I'm really happy with how it came out. I love that story, by the way. That was awesome. Um, and, you know, this... Uh, <laughs> it was, sorry, it was a good one. It was a good one. Um, this journey that you're about to embark on, man, it raises some obvious but significant questions because I've seen fans asking if there's going to be more songs or an album or an EP or if you have any plans to perform live with your solo material. And I suppose if you were to synthesize the essence of all those questions into one, it would be, to your mind, what is this the beginning of? It's a really hard question to, to answer, Carl, because... If you compare it, say, to God as an astronaut, like the, the path has kind of been carved out there. We know exactly what that is. So whenever there's new God as an astronaut material being written, you kind of, you know, you're obviously going to go out on a tour. And, and, and you know, we're very, very fortunate to have over the years amassed a very loyal following. And we've kind of had the idea of, 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 of what works live and what doesn't. And because that blueprint has been carved out and, or, or printed, you know, we, we kind of know how to shape certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, with this with this solo project, it's slightly different because there's absolutely no <laughs> pl- blueprint done whatsoever. Um, so it's kind of it's difficult to answer that question. It's a bit terrifying, but it's also really exciting as well because it kind of anything is possible at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so to answer your question, I think for now I'm just going to focus on building up an audience. Uh, if people respond well to the music, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I don't think I'm going to do a live show until there's uh, enough of an audience there that may or may not want to see a live show. So it's, you know, it, it, they are two different worlds, you know, mm-hmm. the, the live performance world and the in the studio writing music world are two completely different worlds, you know, mm-hmm. um, you kind of have to commit to one or the other, you know, at the moment over, I think, so I have another few compositions that I'm going to be re- sort of drip releasing over the next number of months. Um, and I'm focusing really like 100% of my energy on those pieces of music. And hopefully in time, maybe this, by this time next year, enough of an audience will have been sort of like developed over the course of the year for there to warrant a live show, mm-hmm. um, which would of course be really, really exciting. You know, um, I love, I love the idea of eventually doing it live. Um, but as I said, first things first, you know, these things are done in steps. And I'm very fortunate to have had the experience with the bands to kind of work out how to systematically go through each step. Um, I guess it's just about staying consistent, focused and, and driven, really. So that's where we are now. Like in, in a really long winded answer, like I would love to do it live. But for the moment, I'm just going to re- continue releasing music and work, you know, with the intention of hopefully lo- uh, doing a show for the down the road. That's fantastic, man. Really exciting stuff there. And um, now I kind of want to get into a portion of the interview where, if you'd be so kind, I'd love to pick your brain on a couple of things. Uh, okay, Jared yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things, when, when we were speaking last week, one of the bands we touched on were Papa Roach. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. you and I were having a bit of fun talking about their song Last Resort and chatting about how we were both kind of hooked on it at the time it first came out. And that song for us was you know, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, a hit at the time. But what's interesting to see now is a new, younger audience discover Papa Roach. They see that song as a classic. And I guess it's part of a moment in time that they don't share with us. So they have a different relationship with it. And it got me thinking, you know, that generally speaking, not all hits have turned out to be classics and not all classics were ever Mm. necessarily hits when they first dropped. So I wonder to your mind, is there even a difference between a hit and a classic? And if so, what might that be, my friend? Yeah, I, I remember that conversation, Carl. I remember having a good laugh with you about that. Um, it's, you know, it's on different radio heads creep, you know, they, they hate playing that live. And it's probably <laughs> one, not one of only their biggest songs, one of the biggest songs ever written, you know. Um, so I guess, well, I suppose it's, it comes, 
maybe it comes down to the artist's relationship with with the, with the piece you know um the difference for me between a, a hit and a classic a classic is oh god it's so hard to say a classic transports you back in time a hit you know generates a lot of money but then a classic generates a lot of money as well it's hard to say i guess a classic a classic is m- a classic is probably just the band's interpretation of what a hit is, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, not every band are going to enjoy playing their biggest compositions or their biggest songs. Um, we try to, like with the band, we try to represent each album um, within reason, you know? It's different with God is an astronaut because there's so many albums, it's difficult to represent them all. But sometimes we will do, we'll we'll leave out one of the bigger songs that people want to hear. If we're trying to promote, say, a new record, we have to include, we, we, we want to include more tracks off the new record. Um, and we might be leaving out some of our bigger songs, but it, I suppose it's, 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 it's what's required for each campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very rambly response, but the difference between a classic and a hit, it probably comes down to time. It probably comes down to the artist's relationship with the piece of music. Um, and it probably comes down to what makes sense during each specific campaign of what the band are trying to promote, you know? I love that. It's hard for us to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I love that answer. And the thing is, there's, there's, there's no right answer to it. Um, it's totally, you know, it's totally subjective, as you said. And as far as rambly answers go, I love rambly answers. So bring them on. Uh, okay. Because I've only got a couple of questions left for you. Um, before I ask you my final one, it would be remiss of me not to touch on God as an astronaut just a little bit, um, mm-hmm. because I know you took some time away from the band and you returned as part of Ghost Navy Tapes number 10, which is an absolutely phenomenal record, by the way. Um, and now you're about to embark on a new tour, which I'm sure is exciting for you all, given how the last two years have played out. Um, but what can you tell fans about what's on the horizon for the band at this time? So we just got back from a UK tour that went really well. Mm-hmm. And it was awesome. Our, we, yeah, it was, it was great. We had a number of really, really cool shows over there. It was a great turnout. And it was just so good to get back to touring actively. You know, We did a few kind of small shows in Ireland throughout the lockdown. But this was our first tour post-pandemic, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, we had a successful UK tour. Uh, next week, we are flying out to... Jeez, I really need to look at the schedule. It starts in the Lille. It starts in Paris. Oh, no, excuse me. It does not start in Paris. It starts in France, in Lille. And then it moves on to uh, all over Europe. Um, so we will be focused on that for the, ne- for the next... Over summer, we have a few festivals and stuff coming up. Um, we're all really excited about it. We think I think the band is... You know, the four of us are really driven at the moment. We've all obviously missed performing live and, and, and performing as a band. So we're all really driven, but we're also very excited. Um, that's what we're... That's the that's on the immediate horizon. We are working on some new material as well at the moment. We have a few, awesome. a few new tracks written. Um, and we have a few other bits and pieces that, that, we, that we plan on releasing and announcing over the next number of months. But yeah, the, 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 the focus at the moment is, is getting sort of uh, the tour and the live performance heads together. Um, we usually rehearse uh, once a week um, just to kind of stay tight as a band, um, which is great. You know? We all, we, you know, we all get on really well. So it, it's great just that, to, to have the, the few hours on, on the, the day that we do rehearse to kind of to run, run, run through. So it's difficult to pick, you know, to, to your previous question about hits and, and, and bigger songs like it, it's it's so difficult to pick uh you know i think our, our, our live set is about 80 80 minutes 85 or something something to that effect and when you when you have a back catalog like the back catalog we have it's very difficult to narrow it down you know to i don't even know how many songs we do but it's always difficult to, to pick a live set you know um but i think we've really nailed this one and judging by the reaction that we have had um, in the UK, I think it's it's, uh, it's it was the right set we chose. We shortlist like maybe three or four different different sets, but the one that we ended off picking seems to be going down really really well. It's quite a heavy set, and um, the response live has been fantastic. So um, yeah, and I think I think I I actually I'll have to check with the lads, but I, I don't know if I don't think we're releasing a new Goddess and Astronaut record this year. It'll probably be next year. Um, but we were very very active over. The lockdown, like we, that was another thing we did. Like, I, you know, we, we really used the time off gigging to our, to the full extent. Like we recorded a bunch of 
you know, live um, material, like we, like the All Is Violent, All Is Bright album, we mm -hmm. recorded in its entirety and um, from start to finish. And we had some cool, like a uh, video put together for it as well. Uh, and then we kind of released that in bits and pieces uh, over the months. Um, so yeah, we, we have a few more bits and pieces like that to come out too. So it's like anyone, it's like any other band, you know, it's just about staying active and, and staying focused. And uh, we're just, we're really, really fortunate to be in the position that we're in to be able to go, you know, all over Europe um, to have a, a really extensive tour in some fantastic cities and have such enthusiastic fans show up yeah. um, and spend their, you know, their hard earned, earned money to come in and, and to watch us play. Um, so it's all, you know, it's, 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 it's impossible not to enjoy. Like I do, I do love it. And it's just so great to, um, we're like family, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, when, we go, when, we, when we all go out on the road where it's like bringing a, bringing a family on the road. So we're all very close and uh, yeah, we all, we all love doing the live show. So we're definitely looking forward to it. And um, yeah, it's just going to be, be great to get back to work again. Thanks. That's that's a wonderful answer. Thank you. And apologies if that hit versus classic question is going to keep you up at night. By the way, <laughs> it will. You know, I don't. It's it's so funny, man. Because I, I, I the honest answer there would have just been I don't know. That's not <laughs> it's not particularly interesting, but it is. What I do know is that I'm going to be doing lots of uh, googling, and uh, I'll come back to you in like. I'll come back to you in a month's time and I'll, we'll have like an hour long conversation about the, the, the differences between hits and classics. I look It'll forward to it and I'll hold you to that, my <laughs> friend. Uh, and I've only got one question for you left um, and feel free to go as deep with it as you would like because while there has always been a certain understated vocal presence throughout your work with vocoders and so on, like you mm. said earlier on, you know, you've remained guided by a certain core philosophy that music instrumentally can speak to you in ways that words can't, and that it's its own language of sorts that it taps into that effective emotional domain we all share and not just a cognitive one. So mm -hmm. my final question for you, Jamie, and again, feel free to take this as deep or a surface level as you're comfortable going, but what is it about instrumental music, this absence of a, you know, dominant vocal presence that has remained uh, sacred? for you um again it comes back to the subjectivity of music like when you listen to conventional call it pop or whatever it may be, whatever kind of music you're listening to if there's clean vocals like a verse chorus verse type you know middle eight back to the chorus twice and then ending on a high that's a that's that's fine that that that's there's nothing wrong with that but for me it's it's kind of like the the, the lead singer telling you what you need to feel about that piece of music you know mm -hmm. and it's almost like an a to z walkthrough on this is what the song's about unless you're someone like bob dylan and you have these like crazy abstract lyrics but for the most part it's 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 the person singing the song telling you how to feel about the music and that works you know for, i mean <laughs> look at that there's a huge i mean 99 percent of the market is pop music and there's some there is some good pop music out there for sure but it's just not really what what I'm what I'm in, interested. It's not really what I can connect with. I prefer to um, I'm I prefer to listen to a piece of music that stimulates you and you know may, maybe you know through your own determinate uh, uh, understanding of the music, uh, you can kind of come to a slightly deeper connection and 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 maybe it resonates you on resonates with you on a slightly deeper level, um, and really like people are entitled to listen to whatever music they want to listen to, you know? Um, but for me, I always, I, I notice myself just listening to, to music without lyrics because I like to, I just like to derive my own meaning, you know? Mm -hmm. um, on, a deep, on a deeper level, I think, I think we're, we're lucky, you know, our, our, but we have, as I said, like we have some great territories in, like over throughout Europe and, and the fact that there is no vocal presence, there is no person telling you what to feel about the music. I think it translates well into certain countries. Like we, we've been blessed to go to some, we've been so fortunate to go to, to like the likes of Turkey and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I just think there's a huge market for instrumental music in even like places in Europe, like Germany, a, you know, I think when you look at Ireland and the UK, there's some great bands and, and, and actually that come out of Ireland and the UK. But for the most part, it's like the biggest, uh, the biggest market, I guess, is like, it, you know, would be pop or R&B or, you know, whatever it may be. But um, luckily in parts of Europe, there's just like a bigger demand for like a wider sort of spectrum of, of different genres. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's, it's and again, rambly answer, but, you know, I just 
for me, I want to write music that people can connect to, they can assign their own meaning to, it can kind of bring them somewhere slightly deeper than if they were to listen to, you know, a, a clean verse, chorus, verse, kind of vocal hook. Um, and that, and that's, that's just what I'm focused on doing. There's nothing wrong with tuning it the other way, um, but that's just where I am creatively at the moment. And I think, yeah, just music can speak to you on such a, a wonderfully deep level. And, and more often than not, you don't need... You don't need vocals, you know. If a piece of music is well written, you don't. I mean, look at the Baraki, look at the classic Mozart back. Look at all that. These these people aren't dropping in vocals with reverb and auto tune. You know, they're just listening to an outstanding piece of music and it's inspiring to them. So, uh, absolutely, <laughs> just to make crystal clear, not comparing myself to those guys. <laughs> um, but like, you know, you know what I mean? Like yeah. there, 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 there doesn't always need to be a vocal presence. That's a very long winded way of saying there doesn't always need to be a vocal presence. Um, sometimes the music is enough. Um, it has been enough for us with the band over the years. And I'm, I'm really hoping that it's, it's going to be enough in this, uh, in this solo adventure that I'm uh, currently embarking upon. I am certain that it will. And uh, Jamie, as always, it's a bit of pleasure hanging out with you this evening. I can only hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Congratulations again on Alaska. It's a wonderful piece of music, and I'm sure the start is something really exciting. I wish you and the guys and goddess, guys and astronaut nothing but their best for the rest of the year and beyond, my friend. And I look forward to catching up when you get back off tour. Man, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to talk to you. You know, we obviously we go way back, and uh, I'm 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 really happy to see you killing it as well in your online work. And it, it's just uh, yeah, it's. It's great to see you, bud. Thanks so much for talking to me today. Thanks so much, brother. Take it handy. See you, man.